morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship. It's good to be back. We we had a trip to Colorado, a quick trip to Colorado, but it was uh, beautiful and the low humidity, and then we come back to this. So, it's actually cooled off after the storm, so I'm glad you're all here for worship this morning. Um, I have no other announcements that anybody has brought to my attention, um, except Janet is standing up. So she probably will walk forward while I tell you to sign the registration pads that are at the end of the pews and um, pass those back to Janet. Do you have an announcement? I'd like to meet with all those who have been singing in the youth choir and anyone else that's here that would like to sing in the youth choir to meet me up front here on this side of the church this morning after worship. Thank you. What's the age requirement? There's really no age Okay. Okay, next week there is, uh, on July 30th, there is a quarterly business meeting. Is that what you'd like to be doing? Okay, I see Pat and Nancy getting my attention. So next Sunday after church, and I see that it is uh, potluck. So, um, so we'll have the luncheon after church. Pat is still got her hand up, and they got a mic for you, so if you want to just go ahead. Sunday that um, we are providing the meat, so she would like to know how many are coming, so she'll know how much to buy. Okay, so if you could, on the registration pads that you may have just signed, pass those back down, and indicate whether you are planning on attending uh, the the luncheon after, after church next week for our quarterly meeting. So if you could do that. Were we having a car wash? Pardon me? Were you having a car wash next Sunday? Uh, I don't know. Were we having a car wash? They're wait, shaking their heads. So, <laughs> yes. So after the quarterly meeting, if you would like, as a fundraiser, uh, we will, and we've done this in the past. It's been many years ago, but... Um, We'll have uh, some instructions after the quarterly meeting if you want a car wash, uh, if the weather is permitting, that we will do that as a fundraiser. So, Alice, do you have a microphone? Did they give you one? I just want to remind the WWW teachers, Tuesday night, 5.30, it's a big important meeting about our curriculum, our schedule, everything for the fall. Please come. The planning meeting on July 25th for WWW, all the teachers. Anything else that I've obviously forgotten? Hey, one week of vacation and you just can't remember anything. And we welcome our pastor back. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he was on a work week for the National Conference of the first of the month and uh, two weeks of vacation, so it's good to be back in the saddle with our pastor up here. All right. So if there are no other hands waving to try to get my attention, why don't you get up and greet one another? If you don't know somebody, introduce yourself.
Good morning. Good morning. And grace and peace to all of you this morning from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ and the life-giving love of the Holy Spirit. It's good to be back. Uh, three weeks away, it's definitely time to come home. Amen? Amen. 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 So I had a wonderful time in Portland, Oregon. was able to represent the church at the uh, convention. We have elected a new general secretary. He was the executive minister from New Jersey, and I believe he's going to do a great job of leading our denomination. Excellent time of listening to people share great information that is going on throughout the world and also to encourage some of our new missionaries. And so you'll hear more about convention and other things happening in the denomination uh, throughout the year. I also had two weeks of vacation, so thank you. David and I and Aaron Poe and Macy and Jessa went camping. Macy lasted one night, but that's okay. She went. <laughs> And uh, we caught one fish and saw five snakes, and that was it. We came home. So it was a short-lived camping experience. And so I thank you for the time I did get half of my house painted on the outside of it. So a lot of heat, but I worked through it. So I'm glad to be back, and I'm glad others are back from their vacation also. So would you join me as we gather this day for our call to worship? It's printed in the bulletin, and I will read the plain text if you would like to be the people who read the bulletin. God has called us here for a reason. Let us worship the Lord. God is in His holy temple. Let all the earth be silent. We do not come before God like frightened children, but as those who are confident that we are wonderfully made, graciously forgiven, and lavishly loved by our Father in heaven. Our high priest is Jesus, tempted as we are and kept without sin. Who is able to sympathize with our human weaknesses? Let us then boldly draw near to the throne of grace, that we may become be welcomed with mercy, kindness, and love. And we obtain God's help in every moment of God, we pray this day that you will come into our midst and gather us to be your people, 
Hear our prayers. Lend your ear to us, O Lord, and answer us as we listen and watch for the movement of your Holy Spirit. Come, O Holy One, come, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Yeah. Uh, we didn't get one song that we're singing right after this one in the bulletin, but it will be surely the presence, and it's on page 131 if you'd like to use your handles. <coughs> Long suffering. 
offering love to oh, many people. Yes. Yes, Nancy. I would like for all of us to be praying for Light of the World Church and for Greg Barney's family, Debbie and their six children and uh, <coughs> their grandchildren. Um, we know what a difficult time this is going to be for that church um, after I feel like we suffered after the death of Kip and uh, I just hope we'll, we're all praying for that congregation and family. Amen. Other prayer requests or petitions? <coughs> I've had someone ask me to please pray for a Roy Bender family. His daughter passed away, Tamara, age 45, and she does leave behind family and children. So please be praying for Roy Bender and his family. Other prayer requests? Pray for the organ. The organ needed some repairs, and so those uh, repairs are going to cost between $500 and $600. And so uh, please pray that God will uh, use the organ in new ways and revitalize it, and that Satan will leave instruments alone. Mm -hmm. Yes? I just ask for prayers for Mama. She's not here today because she went to pick up Emily at the airport at 1130. Italy's host family from Germany is vaca was vacationing here in the United States and asked Emily to come and join them for five days. So, um, traveling mercy as they come home. Amen. Other prayer requests or praises? There was a very good movie last night. Thank you to Mark Calloway and the Outreach Committee. A very good movie called Risen. And um, I hope and pray that they will show it again. Other prayer requests or praises? How many people are going back to work this week as teachers or school administrators or working in the school district? Actually, it's next week. Yes. Any teachers? How many children are ready to go back to school? <laughs> How many grandparents and parents are ready for their children to go back to school? <laughs> so let us remember everyone who's getting ready for school. Let us pray. O oh, good and gracious Father, we come into your presence with thanksgiving to rejoice with all of your church in the goodness of your love and forgiving, long-suffering love that you have shown to us in Jesus. How you have patiently waited throughout generations and, and years and years and years, Lord, for your people to call out to you and to come back. Lord, we rejoice for the work that you are doing. The work that you have done in Jesus Christ, the work that you are doing in your Holy Spirit, and Father, the work that you will complete in the consummation and in the age to come. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you are here and present with us, that we can sense your Holy Spirit given to us by your Son, Jesus Christ, and that you call us as the church to petition you, to, Lord, pray like Moses prayed on behalf of the Israelites, to stand in the gap and ask for your assistance, O oh Lord, to be people of encouragement and perseverance. We thank you, Lord, for the good news for Adrienne. We thank you for Jan, and we thank you, Lord, of her passion and compassion as she leads people to complete their GEDs and high school diplomas. Thank you, Lord, for the wisdom that you have given to the ages and for people who are able to share it with us. We thank you for all of our teachers and administrators and cooks and janitors. We thank you, Lord, for our children and grandchildren, everyone who's getting ready to celebrate the last week of summer and return to work. God, we earnestly pray that you will bless our schools with wisdom and knowledge, with protection, that, Lord, you will guide our teachers and all schools, Lord, to bring children to the knowledge of your saving grace. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the gift that you have given to us. And, Lord, we pray that you will continue to help people who are traveling and reaching out to loved ones, Lord, and bringing them home. Grant travel mercies as you have done all summer, O oh Lord, as you have guided us on vacations and renewal and rest in preparation for the work that you have for us this fall. And God, we come as a church family knowing the burden of suffering and asking, O oh Lord, that you will guide the light of the world and all of these families, O oh Lord, who are grieving into your mercy and grace. Lord, we pray for Roy and his family. We pray, Lord, that you will guide them and all who struggle with loneliness, O oh Lord. 
to the inspiration and the work of the Comforter and the Counselor who is our God. And Lord, we pray that you not only work through us, but through musicians and all musical instruments, Lord, as you give us, O Lord, instruments to worship and praise your holy name. God, thank you for the many gifts that you have given. Thank you for the gift of salvation in Jesus. And thank you for your willingness to hear our prayers. We offer them in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. May it is not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of God. Listen to this scripture text coming to us from Genesis chapter 28. The story of Jacob's dream at Bethel. Genesis 28, starting in verse 10 and ending in verse 19. Jacob left Beersheba and sat out for Haram. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway, a ladder resting on the earth, with its top reaching into the heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the place Bethel. I'm reading from Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 12 through 25. So, dear brothers, you have no obligations whatever to your old sinful nature to do what it begs you to do. For if you keep on following it, you are lost and will perish. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit you crush it in its evil deeds, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And so we should not be like cringing, fearful slaves, but we should behave like God's very own children, adopted into the bosom of His family and calling to Him, Father, Father. For His Holy Spirit speaks to us deep in our hearts and tells us that we are really God's children. And since we are His children, then we will share his treasures for all God gives. For all God gives his son Jesus is ours now too. But we must also share his suffering if we are to share his glory. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will give us later. For all creation is waiting patiently and hopefully for that future day when God will glorify his children. For on that day, thorns and thistles, sin, death, and decay that overcame the world against its will at God's command will disappear. And the world around us will share in its glorious freedom from sin, which God's children enjoy. For we know that even the things of nature, like animals and plants, groan in sickness and death 
as they await this great event. And even we Christians, although we have the witness of the Holy Spirit within us, aren't free from trouble. We too wait anxiously for that day when God will give us our full rights as his children, including the new bodies he has promised us, bodies that will not be sick again and that will never die. We are saved by trusting, and trusting means looking forward to getting something we don't have now. For a man who already has something doesn't need to hope and trust that he will get it. But if we must keep trusting God for something that hasn't happened yet, it teaches us to wait patiently and confidently. This is the word of the Lord. God gives graciously 
So I invite our ushers forward to receive our offering as we pray. God, we thank you that all good gifts come from you. And everything we need has already been given, O oh Lord. You just need to gather it in. So move us and bless us as we give, O oh Lord, to you and to the work of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>
that are in my backyard. And so sometimes I have to read this to figure out how much I should use to kill those creeping things in my yard. Have you ever had to pull weeds? Or ever had to fight weeds? Sometimes even in my garden I have to pull because in my garden I get crab grass. So sometimes the grass is what I'm pulling out. And today, we have to remember our fight with weeds and really ask the question, where did weeds come from? Why are there so many weeds in the soil? It goes all the way back to the creation story that when our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned, guess what God did? He cursed the ground and said, thorns and thistles will come out of the ground. You will hoe and cultivate and try to grow crops, and guess what is going to grow up? Weeds. Weeds all over the place. And Jesus will remind us in our gospel lesson today that there are even weeds among us. Not just weeds in the ground, but God has given graciously good seed. He wants us to grow and be good people, but once in a while, who are among us? People who do bad. Weeds. And what should we do with them? Should we hunt them out? We should pull them, right? We should go through the congregation and pick out people and just kick them out of the church, right? No! Shake your head. No! That's what our thinking says. I pull weeds in my yard, and I pull weeds out of my yard, and therefore I should pull weeds out of the church, right? People I consider to be bad. Is that what Jesus tells us? No. What does he tell us to do with those weeds who are in the church? Pull them. He would think we'd say pull them, but do you know what he says? Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Everybody will know they're a weed by their words and their actions. And God will deal with them in the end. That really, even bad people in church, we have to, have to love them. And we have to continue to love them. And pray that God will change them, right? God will change them from being a lead into a wonderful person. So let me remind you, these tools are good for the yard, but not good for the church. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your ongoing love that helps us, O oh Lord, to be good people. And when we're bad people, your love that makes us different, that changes us more and more into the beautiful people you want us to be. Help us, O oh Lord, to deal with difficult people with kindness and love. In Jesus' name, amen. You may walk to Children's Church or back to your seat. Hold them out! Get rid of them, right? That's been many a church's answer. I remind you that even as Baptists, that was the early answer. What should we do? We should just get rid of all the sinful people in church. That's what our founder decided, Roger Williams. And so he started the Baptist church, and eventually he got to the point thinking that Baptists were not good enough, so he left. And he left with his wife to start a new church of holy good people. And guess what happened after that? He left that church too, because people weren't good enough for him. That eventually it ended up, it was just Roger Williams and his wife. And guess what he did? Kicked her out. That's exactly right. He kicked her out. She wasn't good enough. And he ended up being by himself. And that is quite the story of our early Baptist founding in comparison to the story today from the gospel. What do we do with people who are just weeds in our world and in our church? Today's lesson is really one of three lessons. If you listened to the gospel lesson last week about the seeds that God graciously and liberally set, passed out the seeds on the path and upon the thorny ground and upon the rocky ground and the good soil, God is the one who graciously sows. And what's interesting about that story is that God gives lavishly. He knows some of the seed will not return to him, but God still gives. And in the story today, there are two things that are in common to that story last Sunday. The seed, but also the weeds. And so let us listen to this story coming from, just, from Matthew chapter 13. The parable of the weeds. And if you have the King James Bible, it's actually the parable of the tares. Listen. Jesus told another parable. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the religious leaders. He's talking to all the people who were supposed to be good. He told them this story. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, 
Didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he said. The ser servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together and tell the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it to my barn. And then to verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house of the disciples, came to him and said, Explain this parable to us of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons and daughters of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons and daughters of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have turned your ear to us to hear you. Now, O oh God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to know. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. I've been very thankful for the rains that have come this summer. I know that our town and our community can be very dry in July. And so wasn't it a wonderful relief yesterday as those cool winds blew in and the rain came? I was very thankful to see the rain and everything until I realized all it was doing is really watering the weeds in my field. <laughs> weeds that have seemed to suck up everything that is going on. I don't know about you, but I have a problem, and it is weeds. Thistles and thorns, creeping crabgrass, creeping geranium. Anybody else have a problem with their yard? Maybe you have more chemicals on it, or have somebody else take care of it. Praise the Lord if that's you, just praise the Lord. But for me, I battle weeds. I know what Ralph Waldo Emerson said. He said, a weed is simply a plant whose virtues have not been discovered. <laughs> Let me assure you, he has not been to my yard. He has not been to places around here that I see weeds that are creeping up between the concrete or the brick that is being laid. They, we as Americans spend billions of dollars each year trying to get rid of weeds, trying to pry them out, pull them out. We have even come up with some creative ways of digging them out. Tellers and discs and weed whiz, uh, weasels and all these other things. Billions of dollars are spent on that one problem alone trying to get rid of the weeds. We use gallons of herbicides and poisons. I know people who boil vinegar and pour it on stuff, or bleach and pour it on stuff, or buy gallons of Roundup and kill everything, right? That was one person's idea. Let's just kill all the weeds in the grass and kill it all. And then you won't have a problem at all, except for the dust blows away. I know there are many things that we use, but one of my favorites is always my grandmother who was bent over in her yard most of the time with a dull kitchen knife, stabbing at things. We thought she had gotten crazy quite a few times, but she came in for water and was sane. But I will always remember her coming in with that pile of weeds. And what did she do with it? She threw it on the compost pile, or she threw it on the pile, or she threw it somewhere to get rid of it. It is amazing with how many weeds we have to deal with. That once you pull up one daily line, what happens? more appear, and that's because weeds are part of our world. Agricultural people will tell you that there are approximately two million weed seeds per acre of soil. Two million weed seeds per acre of soil. So that every time you kill one, there are plenty of others that want to come in. And so we hear about this, how weeds come into our world. And Jesus would know that from an agricultural country. He would know that his people had to deal with weeds. And sadly, they didn't have the chemicals we had. They had to go pull them or wait till harvest to clip off their heads and to get rid of them. 
And so in our story today, it's quite interesting that Jesus will tell a story about the Pharisees. How God has spread out upon this earth lavish seeds, good seed, ready to sprout. And what comes up? Good and evil. Really explaining why there are even troubles in the church. The story is simple but profound. And you probably know it. A man, a farmer, went out to sow seed. And what did he do? He sowed good seed. He would probably have gotten his seed from Scott's, right? 99.89% pure weed free. And he went out and he cast it all over his field. And while he was sleeping, what happened? An enemy came in and sowed weeds. We probably don't think about that, do we? That our neighbor would even think about casting their weeds into our yard, blowing their dandelion bushes into them. But that's what happened. Jesus would tell them the story would happen. And when all of a sudden the wheat came up, so came the tear. We hear the word is weed in our gospel today. But in the old English, it's a tear. A T-A-R-E. And does anybody know what that is? It is a plant that is similar to wheat. But it looks like wheat, and when it starts to grow, you think it's wheat. But when the head comes up, it is bad. It is very bad. It doesn't produce wheat. It produces, rather, something very destructive, something evil, a darling. And it is poisonous if you eat it. Today, we often don't think about it because our modern combines are able to sort out the black bad seed from the brown wheat. But in the ancient world, you had to pick it out. Because if you got some of the tear seed into your crop, what happened? It would get into your food, and it would cause hallucinations, and even death. And so this issue is really an issue of life and death. And so in the morning, when the serpents got, servants got up, went out into the field, what did they see? They saw the tear. They saw a problem. And their solution is very simple. What did they do? They blamed the farmer. Isn't that what we do oftentimes in our life? When there's trouble or evil in our world, who do we blame? Oh, it's God's fault. Oh, God is in trouble. If he would have just made perfect people in this world, there would be no problems. And that's exactly what the servants do. The minute there's trouble, they turn to the master and they say, it's your fault. It's your fault. Didn't you sow good seed? And Jesus is very clear, yes. It was good seed. So why is there a weed? Why are there bad people in the world? And not only that, why are there bad people in every church? Now, I don't want you to point any fingers. I don't want you to think of anyone else. But it's true. And even as a pastor, I have to admit, that was one of the hardest lessons I ever learned, that Satan has his servants in the church. Now, that is really a struggle, because as Christians, we think, oh, everyone who is here is loving, is kind, and always wants the best, amen? Amen. I heard at least one other person who was fool. As a young pastor, I thought everybody's loving until they get into my office alone to critique me. There we find out where the true fruit is. And that's what the servants do. They begin to blame God. But if you know the story of creation, you know the problem is not God. What was the problem? Us. When humans, Adam and Eve, sinned, God cursed the ground. God cursed the ground, and the seeds began to grow. He said, with turmoil and difficulty, you will harvest fruit, but you will also plow and have thorns and thistles grow. Here, the story is very clear that the weeds are part of the trouble that we have to face. And as Fred Craddock says, the trouble off inside is not only people in the church, but inside of us. How many of us do not think that somehow weeds grow inside our hearts, our minds, and why Paul writes so much about being careful of what you plant in your thinking? Here, all of a sudden, we hear the story of the servants blaming their master. But the master says, no, I cast out good. It is Satan who is the problem. And we know that he's not only a problem in the world, but even in our lives. I remember what one pastor said. Satan does not need to walk in any church. Why? Because we willingly carry him in on our backs. We often struggle with serving the Lord and being good people. And here Jesus would say, it really comes from the root cause. Our own sin and our own willingness, not only to tolerate evil, but 
to enjoy it. How many times have we not turned an eye away when we should have stopped something, or smiled and laughed when we should have said a frown? Here, Jesus would make it very clear. The problem is everywhere. And so the servants have the next great idea. We should just pull out the weeds, right? We should just go through and pick out people who are evil and cast them out. That's oftentimes what churches have spent their focus on. If we could just get rid of all the bad people in the church, we'd be a good church. Amen? Well, it'd probably be like Roger Williams. We'd be alone. Or we'd be the one kicked out. And so Jesus would tell the story. When the servants came and said, what should we do? Should we pull them up? His warning is no. Leave the weeds alone. Now, why should we leave the weeds alone? Well, Jesus would have a very clear answer. Because in uprooting the weeds, you might uproot the wheat as well. We all probably know someone who's been injured by organized religion. People who thought they were doing something good, and all of a sudden, they hurt someone else. And what often happens to people who are hurt by the church? They just disappear. They stop coming. They disengage. And that is Jesus' warning, that we should always be careful with one another, and even we ourselves, that sometimes when our best ambitions are to do good work and accomplish good things, we oftentimes hurt one another. And so what should we do? We should be careful. That's the warning of the farmer. Do not go and uproot the wheat when you uproot the small weeds as well. But his warning is simply, leave them alone. Leave them alone and tolerate evil? No, that's not what he's saying. What we do is simply leave them alone and let them show themselves and their true character. They will come up and by the time the head appears, you will know if it's wheat or a tear. And so here, his warning is to leave them alone. Because oftentimes, we are incapable of identifying true plants. I remember one time my grandfather asking me to come and help him weed his garden. I pulled everything, and I was happy at the end of the day. And he was not happy with me at all. Can you imagine? And that's because I couldn't know the difference between a weed and what was valuable. And that is Jesus' warning too. Sometimes we think the problem is other people. When actuality it is ourselves. Sometimes we think we have an answer to that problem, when in truth we do our best. And so his answer is very careful. Let the conspiracy and let the counterfeits be, and when they're truly identified, then address them. Jesus will say in Matthew 18 how we should do that, a sermon for a later day. But one of the other things that we need to be careful of is not only can we mistake the identity of a true person of faith from another, we oftentimes do not realize that God has the power to change things. In our world, people are good or evil. They're born good or they're born bad, right? And that's not how Jesus would address it. Part of Jesus' ministry is helping us realize His power to change things. Oftentimes, what we identify originally as weeds, God has the power to turn into wheat. Because that is what Jesus does. The power of transformation, the power of change, that power available to anyone who comes and calls on his name. And that is why Jesus gives the warning through this parable, let God do the sorting in the end. In the end, when we get to the kingdom of God, God will truly take out of the church those who are not His, and we will be surprised who they are, but also we'll be surprised who is in. Our human eyes cannot truly see the difference, but God knows. And that's why Jesus finally says, we should rely upon Him, because no one is going to conquer the church and destroy the church without God's consent. And he won't consent to the destruction of the church or his children. Patiently wait, Jesus would tell us in this parable. Wait and allow the angels to gather us in the end. Because we don't know the end judgment until that day. God has time and power to change us, to help us to grow, and to be better people. That is why Paul wrote, He who began a good work with you will bring it to completion before that day. So my brothers and sisters, 
What is the answer to all of our troubles in the world? Wait, watch, and listen. For God will truly protect us and guide us to the cross and to be the people He has called us to be. Satan is not going to win. Jesus will win. And as it says, the children of God will be gathered into the kingdom of God by His grace. Leave the weeds alone. Protect and harvest the wheat and bring up those good virtues that are already inside you. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your perfect vision, the way that you look into our hearts and souls where no one knows. You know us inside and out, O oh Lord, and we cannot hide ourselves from you. So, Lord, we come to confess to you we're a bunch of weedy people. Lord, we have done things that are wrong and it's our own fault. Lord, there is no one to blame but us. And Lord, we ask for your transforming grace. Lord, we know that you can change problem people into saints. That you can take the worst of the worst and make them the best of the best. And so, Lord, we pray that you will help us work with one another as you work on us and in us. Give us the grace and the patience to endure one another's faults and failures as we look forward to that day when you perfect us in your kingdom. Transform us with your love and help us to see as you see children, sons and daughters of light and grace. Come, O oh Holy One, come, we pray. Amen. If you've seen mostly weeds in your life, and you would like to become weak children of God, all you have to do is ask. If you need wisdom, ask and God gives it. If you need forgiveness, ask and God will forgive. If you need transformation, help against the evil one. Call out, the Lord is near. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, Rescue the Perishing, which is our call to missions and service.
the world. Amen? Amen. And you are among them. Grow and labor and patiently endure the suffering until the kingdom of God comes. Then all of God's children will be gathered into his kingdom and shine forever. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Patiently bear with one another. We will make it to heaven. Amen? Amen. Please be seated if you would like to listen to the postman. Thank you.